So today we're talking about images from the Public Works, 1883 to 1929. Specifically, we're talking about the glass plate negatives that we believe are Public Works. Um, this is a little insert from the image that we used for the publicity, which is a Public Works photo. And it's actually taken from the high resolution copy, which is why you can see the um, detail that you can see, including the family resemblances amongst the children. First, I'd like to acknowledge country. In the spirit of reconciliation, Museums of History New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. And I'm coming to you from Darug country. So basically we're talking about NRS 48814. And what does this mean? Basically NRS series NRS 4881 is the glass negatives from the government printing office. The records come to us in batches and consignment for, so consignment just means a group of records that were received together. A record series is basically a group of records that are a similar format and do the same function. So these are all glass negatives from a particular institution, the government printing office. However, consignment four was not actually created by the government printing office photographers. That's consignment three. And that's the ones that the, the government printing office photographers created. It was listed and digitised by the State Library of New South Wales. And copies are available for consignment three on both our website and at the State Library website. And we do thank the State Library of New South Wales for their cooperation and support in allowing us to show you the titles and images that they digitised. Consignment four, on the other hand, is a real mishmash. Now we know there's Department of Agricultural photos in there. It had its own photographic section dealing with the photos taken for the Agricultural Gazette. And we know there's public works photographs in there, but they're all mixed in together. Now with consignment three, all the photos have this unique running number. So every single image has a number and they're listed in what are called the star register and the Sharkey register. So when you look at the numbers on our websites, you'll see an ST or an SH number. And here we have some examples from consignment four of NRS 4481, showing you some of the agricultural photos and some of the other things that are in there. So we have cabbage man, as we like to call him. You have um, the duck whisperer who was busy getting the duck to pose for a photograph. You have medals and badges that were photographed for William Applegate Gullick, who was the government printer, but did a book that he published on medals and badges of Australia. But there are also things in this consignment, consignment four, that we really can't explain. Um, we've got no idea why we've got this photograph of porcelain dolls. We did think it might have been um, a collection, but obviously not a child's, because children of that time wouldn't have had that many dolls. Um, could it be a, a, an apprentice image that they're capturing these as part of their training? I really don't know. It's actually in a box that contains other photographs from the Department of Agriculture. Why the Department of Agriculture wanted to photograph dolls? I've got no idea. So now we're going to talk about conservation and digitization. Now you would think that glass negatives being old and being glass and therefore fragile, would it be a priority to digitise? But unfortunately, whilst they are a priority, they're not the top priority. The top priority is the acetate negatives, which are the ones that cover the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And that's why if you look on our website, you may see more recent material than older material. Nitrate and acetate negatives have this problem called Vinegar syndrome where they basically shrink until you actually can't get an image of them anymore. So the only way to preserve them is to digitise. Now the glass negatives do not have that shrinking problem. They might crack. Sometimes the emulsion flakes away around the edges, 
but they do not self-destruct in the same way that the acetate negatives do. Other at-risk material are things like cassettes, audio reels, video formats and computer media where the te technology is becoming redundant to read them. So here we have some examples of staff working on NRS 4481 consignment 4. So checking the negative, its condition, anything that's written on the emulsion side of the negative, dusting the negative to get the dirt off. Um, if there's particular dirt, cleaning it, but only on the glass side, obviously, and wrapping each individual image, each individual negative, so that it's got its own wrapper and applying the barcodes. Glass negatives were digitised in-house. Acetates may be sent out-house, but the glass negatives weren't. And mostly they were scanned. However, any negatives that were in very poor condition with cracking emulsion or where there were broken negatives uh, were, scan were photographed on a light box using a digital camera. So what was the Public Works Department? Well, basically the Public Works Department build things. So railways, I think it's up until about 1916, roads, bridges, buildings designed by the colonial architect, government architect, harbour and river navigation, dredges, cranes, dry docks, defence works up until 1901 when the federal government takes over, sewerage, tramways, water conservation, water supply, watering places, wharves, and there's also state industrial undertakings. So it's a wide range of, of activities that they undertake. And you need to ask yourself, would the public works have actually taken any photographs of my topic or of my locality? And I would suggest the best thing is to actually go and have a look at the annual reports, which have all been digitised and are available on OpenGov. You can download these. They date back to 1888. And there's a couple of financial records for the prior two years as well. And they have detailed reports on where the money has been spent. So you'll be able to see what's been done in your community or on your topic. So who were the photographers for the government, for, sorry, for the Public Works Department? And I must say, I've got to admire their ability to A, carry around those cameras and the glass negatives, because glass does weigh a lot. The glass negatives would have been in plate holders. They have to make certain it doesn't get exposed to light before it's put in the camera. And then after it's taken out of the camera, it can't be exposed to light until it's taken back to the office and processed with chemicals. I think we probably take their work for granted a bit nowadays when we all carry around our digital camera in our phone and just whip it out to automatically take a copy, a photograph of something. But a huge amount of work involved in just undertaking these photographs. So there's three pho photographers that we're aware of. From 1883 to about 1895, Joseph Philip Bischoff. 1897 to 1919, John Degadardi Jr and 1912 to 1928, Robert Arthur Bowden. Um, Bischoff arrived in Australia in 1862 and he gave his occupation as a gardener. But by the 1870s, he's described in newspapers as a landscape photographer with a keen interest in the Blue Mountains. John Degatardi Jr. is the son of a photographer and I understand his, his aunt as well was the photo processor. He started work in 1874 as an apprentice in the government printing office. He's a photographer by 1885. But in 1897, he becomes the photographer at Public Works Department. And in fact, he took quite a pay cut to undertake this duty. But possibly he liked the independence of being the sole person, the sole photographer for the department. Bowden starts as an assistant photographer in 1912. Well, he's a junior messenger from 1902. And then he's Degatardi's assistant from 1912 onwards. And he takes over as the photographer after Degatardi retires. In July 1929, the decision is made to close the Public Works Department photographic branch. Unfortunately, the correspondence between the Public Service Board and Public Works hasn't survived. I suspect it's all about cost cutting and maybe they see it as duplication. Um, 
But anyway, so Bowden is transferred to the government printing office on the 1st of September 1929, and he actually resigns on the 5th of July 1930. But before he left Public Works, he was actually photographing the Harbour Bridge for J.C. Bradfield, and Bradfield continues to employ him to photograph the bridge. And later on, he worked, Bowden worked for the Metropolitan Water Board. And I'd like to thank Gail Newton and Megan Martin and Sylvia Ray for supplying us with information about Bischoff and Bowden. Now, when you look at the, our website, when you look at other people's websites, you'll see there's duplicates, triplicates, quadruplicates of exactly the same image. And it's the nature of photography. You've got the negative, which is the original image that's taken, and then you make prints from it. Some of those prints end up being given to other people. Um, some of them get put in albums, and here we have an image from the Plague Cleansing album, which are held by both us and the State Library and digitised on both websites. And I just wanted to put up a comparison between the two images, what you can actually see in them. Obviously, the print has aged yellowed slightly, although it is also the type of print that it is. The second reason why there are duplicates is that in the 1970s, we were trying to provide access to this material. And this was before scanning was readily available. So we decided to print some of the negatives onto modern paper and using modern chemicals. It was a very costly exercise, so a very small number of prints were done. And I just also wanted you to have a look at the um, the differences in tonal quality, if you like, between the modern print and the scan from the negative. There is a, a black and whiteness, if that's a phrase I can use, um, to the, the, the 1970s prints, quite a strong contrast that isn't in the negative. So sometimes you'll see um, images and consignments 4481 consignment one and consignment two that are duplicates of the negatives we're now scanning. And we are attempting to link those so that we know which negative belongs to which print. A word about titles, dates, and find how you find items on our websites. I really want to emphasize here that the title that we put on the image is not what you or I can see in the image. It's the title that was assigned by the agency that created the image. So this is the register for the Government Printing Office records, the STAR register, uh, for consignment three. And I think this is my favourite title. It's Main Roads, Photograph Showing Beautiful Corners and Ugly Corners by Signs. Now, if we look at the first print down the bottom, I can see that it's Pacific Highway Linfield. I can see the Linfield Post Office, um, but that's not what the photographer is seeing. The photographer is seeing the Moran and Cato's T sign, which has been painted onto the wall of the building at the corner there. And there is no advertising hoarding in this image because of the fact that Karingai Council had a ban on advertising hoardings. Unlike Willoughby Council, and this second picture is further down the Pacific Highway at Chatswood, Willoughby Council did not have a ban on advertising hoardings. And so you've got these hoardings, which I presume are the ugly corner because they're blocking the, the um, line of sight for the drivers who are trying to turn. And although, as my colleague Anna has said, how can anybody call a corner ugly when it's got a picture of Clark Gable on it? But nevertheless, and notwithstanding, that's the title, the photographer gave it, and that's the title that we will have in our website. Now, the Public Works did not have a running number register in the same way that the Government Printing Office did. Bischoff did keep his negatives in running order and he numbered them, and he scratched the number on the emulsion side of the image right up next to the very edge of it. So here you can see the number 160, and his ones look very much like sevens. And down in the book, you can see that 160 is the orange post office. The Public Works reorganised the Bischoff negatives at some stage and renumbered them. So this has also got the number A33. 
And we believe that A stands for buildings, we've seen B for bridges, R for railways and so on. And then they boxed them up by subject. So the Bischoff negatives are unfortunately not in the running number order that they were originally in. Now our titles are drawn from those boxes that the negatives were stored in, and our dates are drawn from the negatives itself. Both Bowd, sorry, both Decatati and Bowden wrote the dates and the negative numbers on the emulsion side of the negative, but they numbered actually within each box. So numbers one to 10 will be constantly repeated throughout the entire collection. The top examples are Dego Tardi. The third one down is a Bowden. And he actually wrote his number so you could actually see it when it's printed. So we've assigned each image unique barcode and we use that number to identify the image. That's the horrible AF number that you'll see in the catalogue entries. Now the Public Works Department kept their negatives in their original boxes and they pasted a label on the side saying what, what the subject was. These are cardboard and paper and they just have not survived as well as the negatives. Finally, I just want to mention that if you see a title and it's got words in square brackets, that's something we've added that wasn't found on the box title. And we've added it in hope to try and provide a bit more clarity. And sometimes it's been recommended to us by people who know what they see, such as WJ Thorpe, Bill Fippen or Mark Langdon. And here are some examples of those boxes. And as you can see from the second bottom one, it's obviously resumptions, although that's a guess. Where it is, I can't see because we've lost the place and we've lost the year, but that's okay because that should be written on the actual negative itself. Um, and you can see the two boxes for Mr. Bradfield's houses. That is the actual title that was used for those two boxes. The other thing I want to mention is about the fact that, um, if I haven't already said this, that the Degotardi particularly writes his dates right up close to the edge of the negative, which is where the emulsion is likely to crack, and it's also where it silvers. So they can, they may, I'm pretty certain, in fact, that all Degotardis have dates on them, but sometimes we haven't been able to read them because of this. Finding things in our catalogue, you go to our website, search the NRS-4481-4 and then put in the word that you're after. Just remember that keyword is not your friend because there's no guarantee that that word will appear in part of the title. Now I would always recommend that if you find an image that you're interested in, you check what else is in the box because the photographers tend to take like 10 photographs at a time. That was they went out and went to a place and took a certain number of photographs. So there may be something else that you're interested in that hasn't come up to using your key, the word that you've put in. Don't get perplexed if in fact you think, but wait a minute, I'm getting stuff on Parramatta Road and the government dockyard. Why is this? They wouldn't be in the same box. In fact, they're months apart. That's because our boxes are deeper than the photographer's original box and often contain two or three or even four boxes and different jobs, not just the one job. Once you've found something you want to look at, open the entry up on its own page, click on the little window that's underneath the words image gallery, and it'll open up in another, box, another window. You can then enlarge, you can right click and save as to download the low resolution copy of the image, if, like me, you get very annoyed by the little banner that's covering up the little bottom bit of the photograph, then click on that little last symbol to open up just the photograph on its own. You can also tag items in our catalogue. So if you want to have to do a search and you find all these images of scaffolding and you want other people to be able to see photos of scaffolding, you can add a tag that says scaffolding. Just remember that other people can see your tags. And there's a webinar on our web page on how to tag. There's also a guide on our web page on how to cite and publish. And if you're interested in the glass negatives, there's a very good story by Holly Schult on our web page, which shows you the processes to actually create and then process a glass negative. 
And there's also a story on our web page that shows our conservator unboxing a glass plate negative box. Thought I'd throw in some statistics. We're going to look at about 156 of these public work images today, and that's less than 0.1%. So far, we've digitised about 22,000 of them. There's about another 800 still waiting to be done. These are the ones that are actually broken and damaged and are taking time to do because of this. Not everything is showing up on the website at the moment. So there's 22,000 in our collection management system, but only 18,000 have made it to the website. So keep your eyes peeled. There will be more coming through, another 4,000 to come through. And roughly half of these we attribute to public works. Now, the majority of them are dry plate negatives. There are about 300 that are described as wet plate. There are also a few diapositives as well. In terms of size, the majority of the ones that we believe are public works are 10 by 12 negatives. And the next largest size is 6.5 by 8.5 inches. Um, I had thought that maybe they would have one camera and then finish with that camera and do a, a second camera. And therefore there'd be a time differentiation between the two major sizes, but they're not. They seem to be doing 10 by 12 inches really from the 1870s to 1916. And then there's about eight images that go up to 25. And they're also doing 6.5 by 8.5 inches from 1877 onwards. Now you'll notice even though the photographer only starts in 1883 with public works, there are definitely 1870s images in here as well. So let's get to the beefy stuff. Let's actually look at some of these photos. So the first heading is railways and tramways. And this is the zigzag railway. And these are two examples of the way in which they keep coming back to the same project and photographing it over time. These haven't got a title yet, but you can see the progress that's been made in this particular um, bridge. And this is, these are only two from a series of about eight or so. And there we have a Hastings River Bridge in 1920. Lovely reflection in the water there. This is Museum Station. May 1925, and we've actually dated that from a very similar view that's in the series for City Rail 16669, which is albums showing the progress in the building of the City Rail. Here we have again Museum Station about 1926 with a lovely white ceiling and no railway line in sight. A number of railway stations, we have Albury, and on that one you can actually see the damage done to the emulsion around the edges of the, um, of the photograph. We have Harden Railway Station, and we have Mount Russell Railway Station. This is another example of how they keep coming back to the same position to photograph a project over time and to record the changes that have happened with that project. So this is the construction of Central Railway Station in Sydney. And as you can see in the first photograph in April, they've just basically put up the piers for the road going up. And by October, uh, they've made much more progress and that road is further constructed, but they're basically coming back to literally the same spot each time which is truly amazing. Here we have two different views of Central Railway Station and a good example of how often the same subject or topic has been dealt with by the different photographers. So we have um, the railway station in 1906 and then we have the railway station in 1920 where another two floors have been added. You can just see the little round, I guess they're windows, um, which were at the top near the roof in 1906 and now halfway up the building. And of course the clock tower is now there as well. And interiors, interiors of Central Railway Station in 1906, um, the one on the right is the ticket office. And we have some tramway photos, not a huge number in comparison to railways. 
Um, and again, square brackets, unidentified image of man standing at signal control because we're not certain exactly which tramway signal box this is. Roads and bridges. Mr Vernon, who I think is from the Government Architects Deposit section, outside the Ganagara Hotel, which is near Walgett, and the condition of the road. Here we have what we believe is the Glebe Island Old and New Bridges, 1900. So you can see the old bridge in the front and then the new bridge is being built behind it. And this is, we believe, the Piermont Bridge. And you can see up in the corner there, the, um, the B86, right up in the left-hand top corner, which is where you need to look out for the dates or the additional numbers. Here is the new Piermont Bridge and the superstructure, the opening is actually swinging over the top of the old bridge in 1902. Here we have an unidentified bridge in 1905, but again, you've got the new bridge right next to the old bridge, which is being demolished and a lovely contrast in texture, again with figures in it so that you've got that sense of scale. Wellington Bridge in 1920, again, you've got the old bridge right on the left with the no admittance sign and you've got the new bridge, again with figures, the boy on the person on the bicycle to give you that sense of scale. There's a series of photographs called Broken Hill to Adelaide Trip, Mr. Davis. And this is one of the more memorable ones, pulling the vehicle out of the mud. I can't help wondering how they got their clothes clean afterwards. Apologies, we've gone too far. Radio, so this is the building of a bridge. We haven't got which bridge it is. I'll draw your attention to the punt um, with the horses and carts right down in the left-hand corner. And the title of these is what is written on the box, negatives Mr. F. H. Burrow sent here of bridges. Here we have the George's River Bridge under construction, and we've got the two punts with the cars, the cars parked in three rows. And that's 1926. On the left-hand side, Macquarie Pass. On the right-hand side, um, we don't have a title for this one yet. It's been imaged, but not put into the, um, the system. Possibly National Park, possibly Lane Cove, or, or the Karingai area. Here we have the Queen Bien Suspension Bridge in 1903 with the girls all wearing their very clean pinafores sitting on the side of the river. And if I'm not being sexist, I assume the figures hanging off the bridge are the boys. The widening of the Argyle Cut. So here we have a December 1912 image showing the original cut. And by June 1913, they've demolished those and are putting in the cut that we now know. Parramatta Road in 1920. I just love the, the texture of the mud and also the reflection of the water um, and the light coming back off the mud. I don't know that I'd actually want to drive in it, but um, it makes a, a beautiful image. Building roads, this is Allison Road, Sydney, 1920, laying down the um, stone base. And, and this is the second one, the one on the right is the Prince's Highway in 1921, where we've got a, a grader crushing the stone. We have a series of these photographs, which we call man standing by side of road. Um, they cover the Great Western Road, they cover the Richmond Road, they cover the Pitt Town Road, and I think there might be some for the Parramatta Road as well. But they're in numbered order. So where I said beforehand that most images have a numbered between one and 10, 
with these road ones and with some of the cracked building ones, they are in a numerical order. So you can put these road ones in order and see the progress as you go along. And I've chosen Penrith because that's an area we know well. And so the first image we've got, number 72, shows you the Anglican church and you can see the row of terraces that is still here today. The next one, you can actually read the white building about halfway down. You can see the Australia Arms Hotel. And the Australia Arms Hotel is still in roughly the same situation nowadays. So this is all High Street Penrith. I've cut out the middle two along here, but in this number 76, you can actually see behind the gentleman's head, the road and rail bridge going across the Nepean River. And now we're coming up to the road and rail bridge and you can see the comparison with modern day down the bottom, thanks to Google Earth. Finally, we're at the road bridge and not a huge amount has changed. And then we're coming off the road bridge into EMU Plains and there is still that same curve as you go around. And EMU Hall would be, the back of EMU Hall would just be to the right of where the car is. I assume the role of the gentleman standing in, on the roads is to make certain that the photographer doesn't get run over. Now we're looking at some buildings. So this is the Garden Palace. Um, the exhibition was opened in 1879, so we assume these are around about the same time. This is one of those puzzles that we have. So we have this one image that shows this Maori longhouse next to the Garden Palace. But we have a second image that's in a box that suggests that it was at the Hobart International Exhibition in 1894. The only problem with that is that New Zealand didn't actually exhibit at the Hobart International Exhibition. But I can't find any reference in the newspapers in 1879 to the Murray Longhouse being in Sydney. So it's a bit of a puzzle, that one. This follows the fire to the Garden Palace, uh, which happened in 1882. You can sort of locate where you are by the little statue down in the left-hand corner, which is the Huntsman's and sorry Huntsman and Dog statue. So this is the Botanic Gardens. Bischoff has a series of photographs um, that are just down as being Sydney or city buildings, circa 1884, and this is one of them, which is a stonemason's house. And I just want to draw your attention to the left hand top. You can actually see Bischoff's number running backwards and you can see the date, the 6th of January, 1886, again next to it. And this is where we've drawn our dates from. But it is very close to the emulsion and you can see how the emulsion has been damaged in the left hand top corner. Here is another one of these ones from Bischoff. 1885. This is actually near the corner of Market and Clarence Street. When I first saw this one, we were amazed by the, if you like, the lack of building laws, the lack of, um, no, there isn't a straight line there. My colleague Colleen, however, was quite amazed by the meat, raw meat hanging out in the street and the horse manure showing up on the street as well. We identified where this was by the fact that there was a tobacco factory next door and then using Trove and the fantastic maps that are available from the City of Sydney website digitised, we're able to pinpoint its exact location. Another one of these early city buildings from um, Bischoff and this has got 34 and WW Billiard. Um, William Whaley Billiard was a solicitor who was at 34 Castle Ray Street. So we assume this is 34 Castle Ray Street. We know Dego Tardy has photographed the rocks, but Bischoff also photographed the rocks. And again, with human figures out the front for scale. So this is 1884. And you can just see the very, very faint numbers and dates just up there on the top of the image. Again, another Bischoff, which is Fort Macquarie, um, Sydney Opera House site, 1889. And again, you can just see his dates and numbers and the renumbering by the Public Works Office up in that left-hand corner. This is present-day Martin Place. 
Um, we haven't got a date for this one, but its building is being demolished opposite the general post office, which is lacking its clock. The National Art Gallery must have been a blockbuster because it's telling you that they, you can only go in exit in the front doors and you have to enter from the side. The photographs have thrown up some buildings that um, perhaps we're no longer aware of. Some rather interesting looking buildings, such as the licensed waterman's shed at Benelong Point, right next to the walls of Fort Macquarie, and the Altamo Meat Market, which was very elegant for its purpose. And that was being built in 1887. This is the Redfern Courthouse, the construction of it, 1897. Now, the gentleman who's kneeling in the gutter, um, I did wonder what he was doing, but there are two photographs of this building and he's kneeling in the gutter in both of them. So I have to assume he's doing something work-related in the same way that the gentleman standing on the scaffold and on the ladder are doing something work-related. The children, however, don't appear in the second image. And it wasn't until I looked at this one quite a few times, I realised that one of the kids is doing a handstand. Here's another, po here's a post office. Even though post offices went to the federal government in 1901, public works were involved in um, upkeep and building and things like that. Here we have the construction of Little Bay Hospital, 1915. There are a series of images of government residences. So we have Miss Rawson, presumably the daughter of Governor Harry Rawson with her animals in 1906. It's amazing the cockatoo stayed still for the photograph. The dogs have moved. Again, we have Hillview, which was the governor's summer residence down at Sutton Forest. And we have Harry Rawson and his family standing in front of it in 1905. We have interiors of government residences, such as this one of Hillview in 1903. I wonder if the, they brought their furniture with them from England. Maybe it was just the photographs and the tiger rug that they brought with them. A little bit fussy. Here we have portraits of Gerald Strickland and family, again at Hillview in 1915. It's a lovely family portrait. There were two choices here. There was one in which the mother was frowning at the little toddler because she had apparently moved. So I decided to go with one where everyone was smiling happily. Here we have interiors from Cranbrook, um, much less fussy and more to my taste. Although I do wonder about the display of we weapons around the portrait of Queen Victoria. Does that look threatening? And we have these photos of wine glasses. As they're in the box that has the photos of seals of, of um, coats of arms of governors, I assume that it's something to do with the governors as well, but just a really great photograph. The sale of Cranbrook. Um, Cranbrook was the government governor's residence for a short while. And I can't help wondering whether the gentleman in the straw hat down in the left hand corner here, who is beautifully displaying the Cranbrook subdivision poster, whether he's some plant that the photographer arranged to sort of do that. Lovely description in the newspapers at the time of all the well heeled folk competing to buy Cranbrook. We have photographs of industrial undertakings, Port Kembla Powerhouse, 1927. The construction of Zara Street Powerhouse at Newcastle, circa 1915. The interior of the Ultimo Powerhouse, 1899. And of course, that's been in the news recently because of the um, things that are happening with the Powerhouse Museum. Lithgow Blast Furnace, that wasn't a government undertaking, but we have this photograph of the Lithgow Blast Furnace from 1909. State Monia Pipe Works, 1916, showing how the pipes are actually made.
two quarries, the one at Glebe Island and the Kaihama Metal Quarry, both 1918 and 1916. And you might find duplicates of this photo because it was taken for the Harbour Trust. So the Maritime Services Board, I believe, also has images like this in the photos that we've digitised from the MSB. We have photos of floods. This is the May 1913 flood at Maitland. What I like is the detail that you can see. You can virtually see the wallpapers in four of the different rooms. Uh, one of my colleagues, Tara, says that she feels as though it's like a film set, something from um, The Wizard of Oz, the way the house has been picked up and put down again. But obviously the house is also um, taken off the corner of the, the house that's next to it as well. This is um, Shark Creek Bridge, 1920. It looks to me like it's been damaged by flood. We have a lot of pictures of water and dams. So these two are of the building of the Sydney water supply, 1884 and 1888. And then we have these pictures of the ocean, the Manly Ocean Outfall Sewer, uh, 1925, which uh, the image of the water, the contrasting colours are quite extraordinary. This is Warren's Weir in 1912. And again, the, the ability of these cameras to capture the flow of water and the shapes of um, the weir itself is fascinating. This is the June, June Weir, 1904. And this is quite fascinating. This is also fascinating because um, it was only built in 1902 but by 1904 it had been destroyed after trees were washed down the river in the first big rise in the river after the late protracted drought. So only stood for two years, I guess they had to rebuild it. And the Wentworth Lock in 1927. The Berem Bed Weirs, the Wickets, 1910. And we have a lot of photos of dams, so I've just restricted myself to these four images. But this is Cataract, Cataract City, so the workers' city next to the dam, waiting for mail outside the post office, 1903. And then we have a photo of the construction, 1906, again with the human figures um, thrown in to give you some idea of the scale. Both the ones on the wall and then the ones standing um, further back. Barrenjuk Dam in flood, 1916. And yes, there are human figures in this. When I first look at it, I didn't realise, but again, just down there. And there, you've got the human figures to give you some idea of the scale of the thing. And also the Barrenjuk, Barrenjuk village, the workers' village. Cracked buildings. These aren't buildings that have been cracked by works done for the Department of Public Works. These are buildings that have been uh, surveyed beforehand to make certain they don't have any problems that someone can come back and say, your work cracked my building. So they're taking photographs beforehand of cracks in walls. And sometimes they can be very, very boring, but sometimes the shapes can be very interesting. I've never been particularly fussed on the Queen Victoria building, but just seeing a small section of it like this um, is an interesting ex design exercise. A lot of the images are of interiors. Um, they're focusing on the cracks in the ceiling. So we've got the crack there. We've got a crack just there as well, and another one just there. But they're also showing us what people's lives were like. So in the one on the left, you have presumably the an occupant holding back the window to let the light in. You have the lovely painting or photograph of the mother and child, and you have some of the glassware. And again, in the one on the right, you have family portraits, you have the stuffed cockatoo, and you have a lot of other uh, mementos. These are two interiors of industries. So we have a seamstress's uh, factory, 
um, basically they're busy making dresses. Some of the girls are looking directly at us, others have turned away. And we have uh, a display of lace that's laid out. And of course the, the ceiling and the, um, the piers. And we do get some exteriors in these cracked buildings, such as Dr. McClure's Hall of Health and the Weltmer Institute of Suggestic Therapeutics, a system of drugless healing, including radiostatic treatment, pain removed instantly. I wonder why I doubt that. There are photographs of buildings that were resumed for various government works. These generally you get at front of the building and you get the back of the building. This is quite a fun one because it's the Crown Street resumption. So you've got this shop, but he's advertising that the Minister for Works demands this corner and therefore all stock must be sold. This is quite a nice view of the harbour and you think it's a really lovely image until you realise that there is this mound of dirt with a truck and a human figure. Inching its way into the middle of the suburb. And this is the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And you can actually see the dirt, the pile of dirt behind these, this house as well. It has been demolished for windows and doors all pulled out to be for resale. And again, you get the front and back of the buildings. This is one of the few ones where we actually have more than one photograph. Uh, we've got four for this, sorry, more than two photographs. We've got four. So we've got a back aside and we've got two views of the garage with the children. And that's because he ran a, a firm for cars for hire. This is Lawson Hall Prospect also known as Veterans Hall. It was the home of William Lawson. Yes, the Lawson of Wentworth, Blacksland and Lawson who crossed the Blue Mountains. And it was acquired in 1912 for, because the land was wanted for the Prospect Reservoir and the house itself was demolished in 1929. Here we have, sometimes the front of the house is actually very boring and it's what you can see on the back that's more interesting. So particularly the young boys without any shoes lounging around the side of the, the back wall in this one. And sometimes people just don't get the script on how they're supposed to act. So we have this little boy who is hiding his face rather than standing upright for the photographer. We have docks and wharves. So here we have a model for the Sutherland dock at Cockatoo Island. And we have a photo of the construction of it in 1886. And then you have images of ships within the dock. This one is 1904 and it's the HMS Euralis. So there's one in the dock and then there's one on leaving the dock. Walsh Island Dockyard, 1920, showing the buildings and presumably some of the workers. That's Walsh Island Dockyard at Newcastle. One of the advantages of having the public works photographs is you have people coming back to the same activity over time. So here you have coal loading at Newcastle. I would suspect that one's the 1880s and you have coal loading at Newcastle in 1918. Coal cliff jetty and mine, but taking very artistically past the tree. Here we have Port Kembla, 1915. I think you can just see the um, breakwaters forming the harbour, but you can also see the jetties, two of the jetties. Now, this is an interesting one. At Newcastle, the northern breakwater is built on a sandy area called the Oyster Bank, and various ships have been sunk there, and then other ships would get entangled up on those ships. But because it was sand, laying a foundation for the breakwater um, was a challenge. In the end, they decided to sink more hulks and mud punts to form a foundation that they could then put the breakwater on. Nowadays, if you look at the breakwater, you tend to think the Adolf has actually run into the breakwater, but 
but in fact that it's a breakwater that grew out to meet the Adolf wreck. So this image from 1905 shows them pumping the Katoomba hulk full of water to sink it. And what I find fascinating is it appears to have been taken from the top of the Adolf. So just imagine clambering out onto the Adolf with one of those cameras to take this shot. And there are two boxes of this whole um, process of sinking the hulks. And here we have uh, um, Ballina Harbour showing the harbour works. There are photos of dredges, pilot boats. Um, this is the dredge Jupiter. So you've got an exterior view and you've also got an image of the engines. And there are photos of lighthouses. Again, lighthouses did go to the federal government in 1901, but there are still photographs of them within this series. There are photographs of celebrating and remembering. This is the arrival of the American fleet, the Great White Fleet. And this shows five of the 16 ships going through the heads. This is the Governor Philip statue in the domain. Um, but it also has, it was opened in 1897. But there's also this image of who I presume is the sculptor, Achilles Simonetti. Um, next to the, um, the one that he did in his studio in Melbourne. This is Jack's Day, which was a day to raise money during World War I for sailors. And you can see David Jones is just on the left-hand side. Again, they come back sometimes to the same site over and over again for the different decorations. So the Commonwealth decorations in 1901, looking at the Chief Secretary's buildings, and then the decorations for the arrival of Lord Henry Stafford Northcote, the governor in 1904. Didn't expect to find gravestones in amongst the public works images, but we do have uh, um, three. One of um, Engineer McRae's wife that I haven't shown, but these two of employees. I'm not quite certain whether I particularly like the wording on the headstone of Henry Carlton. A tribute to departed merit erected by official friends, whereas Edward Price's one says erected by brother officers, and that sounds a bit more friendly. And here we have Martin Place Cenotaph, uh, the opening ceremony, I believe. And interestingly, what appears to be another photographer standing on his ladder down here, possibly government printing office, also taking his images as well. And there were some unexpected shots. This one, for example, of houses collapsed in O'Connor Street, Chippendale, corner of O'Connor and Balfour Street, reported in the newspapers in 1887, an old sewer from Tooth Brewery burst and flooded into the public works sewer that was being constructed. And you can see the framework here for this shaft for the sinking of the public works sewer. And this flood was due to extraordinary heavy, heavily rainfall, and this caused the houses to collapse. Here we have one of my favourites, which is the traction engine photos. And these ones we can say we know for certain that John de Gotardi photographed because of the fact that these were used in a um, court case in the Equity Court, Supreme Court, the Attorney General versus the McGrath brothers. Now, the McGrath brothers are reported in the Nepean Times in October 1906 saying that they planned to take their wool to and from Sydney, from Emu Plains, where they had their wool scouring business by traction engine because the railway department was charging too heavy, too heavy a freight. The Attorney General took them to court to restrain them from using the traction engine. There were two uh, arguments to the case, one of which was that it was damaging roads and bridges. And the Judge Simpson agreed with that. The second 
argument was that it was actually frightening the horses and was causing a public safety problem because of that. And this is where Dego Tardi comes in because basically he was one of the witnesses and he produced photographs of traction engines which he had taken at various places, described the noise that was made. Drivers had great trouble in keeping their horses under control while passing the engines. He referred particularly to what had occurred on the Parramatta Road. There were instances in which it took two men to hold a horse. And he took the photographs over a couple of days at Darling Harbour, Forest Lodge and Parramatta Road. In the end, the judge decided that he couldn't make the decision as to whether or not this was a public nuisance. And if they wanted to pursue it further, it should go to a jury case, which I don't think they did. They end up just having the injunction against the traction engine based on the damage to the roads and the bridges. Here's another unexpected image, which is basically this panorama of Port Moresby. How do we know it's Port Moresby? Because of this triangular white shape on the top of the hill, which is the Port Water, sorry, the Port Moresby water supply. And if we go on to the other images, you'll see a close up of that on the right hand side. And again, there are two boxes of these Port Moresby images. We have more images from the Broken Hill to Adelaide trip. So there's quite a lot of um, non-New South Wales material because of this trip. There are also a lot of images of Broken Hill mines, which appear to be diapositives. So they're negatives that have been copied onto a glass plate. And here we come to Mr. Bradfield's houses. And this is the image we used as um, our ex our publicity for this session. So why did Mr. Bradfield want these images taken? Well, he was giving a lecture in, he gave a lot of lectures actually about why there was a need for the electrification of the railway and why there was a need for a harbour bridge. And we presume these images were taken for those lectures. So here you have the children playing in their dirt and they're not very nice backyard, but I do love the elephant. And we have other children playing in the street. We have images of the backyards. And we have the contrast with modern looking houses with children standing in their lovely front yards with gardens. And we have some modern apartments. We also have images of people hurrying off ferries. Obviously they need a bridge rather than a ferry. And there's a lot of maps and tables talking about population distribution and where people People are um, travelling by tram and that sort of thing. So finally, to finish, I just want to wish you all a Merry Christmas with these Christmas cards from the Public Works Department. I do like the moonlight on Sydney Harbour, but I'm not quite certain why the Sydney Harbour Bridge should make one feel like it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, but it is still a very, a very good image.